a very warm and hearty good day to all of you. My name is Raman Preetpar Bhatia. I'm a Chartered Accountant from the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, a certified practicing accountant from CPA Australia, and a distinguished Toastmaster from Toastmasters International. In this video, I'm going to talk about the second and third step of internal analysis. The second step is what is performance assessment. So we'll be talking about the people and organizational behavior. Plus, we will be talking more about the gap analysis as well. I hope you all will find some value in this video. So let's start. Now, if you recall this particular slide, this is from the previous two uh, videos uh, where we were discussing the strategic drivers and operational drivers. Now, we will be talking more about people and organizational drivers. Just to recall, what are strategic drivers? Uh, what differentiates us from our competitors? There we talked about industry and market. We talked about customers. We talked about competitive advantage. Second was operational drivers, where we, what are the core activities that we must do? Well, we talked about revenue, we talked about cost. And this time, we'll be talking about people and operational drivers. Now, people, what do we understand with this term, people and organizational drivers? An organization is comprised of people. Organization is not working. People who work in the organization, they take the organization forward. They are our actual resources. They are the actual capabilities for an organization. So an organization is built on how we are managing our people and organizational drivers. So how, to, how do we encourage, how do we motivate, and how do we fulfill the needs of our people. That makes it the people and operational drivers. Look at the people and organizational drivers and how these are performing and contributing to the performance of overall organization, the culture of an organization, the employees who work for an organization the resources that an organization has. All these things together will direct and determine the way in which an organization is working. So we as leaders, we as CPAs, it is important for us to understand these values, the innovation and learning aspect, the knowledge management aspect, because if a leader knows all this, then he or she can combine this so that we can harness this particular resource, how to exploit these resources, how to effectively these resources, and thus keeping all this, these things in mind, we formulate a strategy. So what is it that an organization needs to measure? It needs to measure values. It needs to measure innovation and learning. It needs to balance organization management. It needs to have organization management. So these are the three key principles of people and operational drivers, which is values, innovation and learning and knowledge management. Now we talk about values. Often, uh, we, when we work in an organization, we focus more towards the processes, the resultant outcomes, the final results, right? That is more visible. That is the outside part. But the most important feature is the values. The values with which we are working, the morals, the ethics, the culture that we have in the organization. That is very important. If that happens, everything else will fall in place. The employees will be motivated because once they know what are the ethics with which we have to work, things become more clear. So an organization's core values should be well communicated. They should give the guidance. The direction needs to be clear. Why? Because communicating a clear vision 
inspires and motivates members of the organization to achieve goals it helps in defining it helps in clarifying the norms the ethical standards the culture that is expected from the employees the second one is innovation and learning which essentially means is it my own development no it means the professional development of all individuals looking ahead and managing the knowledge if my organization has achieved something most definitely it will not stay for long it will not stay for ages i should not be thinking that nobody will come near me i should not be thinking that my competitors cannot copy me no that is not the case so in order to maintain that competitive advantage i have to innovate things i have to find out more ways of doing work i have to innovate i have to learn and that learning needs to be continuous how do we do that to encourage learning the organization should expand their capacity of thinking communicating and leading allow people within the organization to learn together be adaptive towards the changes that are happening around you be flexible to adapt to these changes at the same time if you really want to be on top be ahead of your competitors be ready to excel become a learning organization there is only one thing which is constant in life and that is change change is happening all around us so an organization which is stiff and stubborn which says that this is my goal this is my strategy and uh, um, i should not be doing anything more than that i should not be learning more than that will lag behind right so an organization should be ready to adapt to changes right so that's value and innovation and learning for us then we come to the next sub topic which is knowledge management how do organizations become learning organizations because they have perfect knowledge management system what is this knowledge management system how an organization is capturing sharing and ultimately using that knowledge the entire knowledge management system divided into three simple parts capture the knowledge take the knowledge grasp the knowledge share that knowledge distribute that knowledge among your workers among your people so that ultimately these people they start using that knowledge right again knowledge is of two types explicit knowledge the knowledge information that is formally captured and recorded and the tacit knowledge in this present slide it is mentioned both ways it is explicit and explicit while one has to be explicit and one has to be tacit so explicit knowledge is the one which is properly documented formally captured the tacit knowledge is the one which is undocumented knowledge the experience of individuals in the organization it is this knowledge this tacit knowledge which is the most risky one because it is undocumented that's the knowledge of the employees that's the experience of the employees while working right somebody has been working for my, for my organization for very long time he knows the ups and downs he knows what are the cases that will come what he knows all the uh, scenarios that will come in front of the organization and he also knows how to overcome those scenarios now just imagine if this person leaves the organization his experience is gone his knowledge is also gone when if it's not if it has not been passed to his successor or if that knowledge has not been properly documented it is wasted if not used and lost if the employee leaves the organization so it is very important to capture this tacit knowledge and convert it into explicit knowledge how again as i said through articulation through codification through sharing if we have this knowledge management thing properly in place through reward system or say through incentives or uh, maybe trainings or maybe job rotations 
it will lead to a better organizational management. Now, what is the knowledge management process? As I said, if you want to compile it in three words, it is capturing the knowledge, sharing the knowledge, and using that knowledge. But technically, it falls under five processes, which is knowledge identification, knowledge measurement, knowledge retention, knowledge transfer and sharing, and data analytics, right? Knowledge identification, what is it? I identify the knowledge. I identify this is the intellectual property. I identify this is the skill. I identify this is the experience. Now, I have to measure it, right? An example of it is intellectual capital account. Then, once I have measured it, I will try and retain it through experiences, through lessons learned during the process. Now that information is there with me, now what will I do? I will transfer and share this knowledge with my people so that they can use this knowledge. I'll just impart this knowledge. I'll, imp I'll give them trainings. I'll give them documents. I'll give them processes. I'll transfer and share the knowledge. Right. And then we will, the people who have received the knowledge, they will analyze that data. I too will, I as an organization as a whole, I will be analyzing or I will be doing the big data analysis. So knowledge ma management process, five parts, knowledge identification, knowledge measure, knowledge retain, knowledge transfer, and analyzing the data. We have learned everything about knowledge management. We are managing the knowledge, right? So the knowledge conversion between tacit and explicit forms and between organizational levels produces a knowledge spiral. We talked about explicit knowledge. We talked about how explicit, explicit knowledge should be converted into tacit knowledge. How that tacit knowledge should be converted into um, explicit knowledge then again the knowledge within an organization on an individual level and on the organizational level all these things become knowledge spiral if you see the diagram in this slide this is taken from the module knowledge is also moving between levels explicit individual knowledge combined with organizational knowledge individual knowledge socialized into organizational routines Now, if we see this uh, um, this diagram, it says that the what is externalization? Suppose we take a word from here, e externalization. Tacit knowledge on an individual, I am passing it on to, an, to another individual, right? And that another individual will write, will document that knowledge. That is externalization. We talk about socialization, my tested knowledge, I am passing it to organization as a whole. That is socialization. I'm socializing with people. Routinization and explicit knowledge. I have something documented with me. I have that entire process written. I am passing it on to the organization. That will be routinization. It is converted into routines. So all this, this full diagram is the knowledge spiral, right? So just go through this diagram, understand the terms, combination, internalization, systemization, routinization, socialization. Now, the next topic that we have is resources and capabilities. What are resources? Of course, we know resources are the productive assets owned by the firm. Capabilities are what the firm can do with these resources. I have some resources, how I can use these resources. These are capabilities. So both these resources and capabilities, they have to combine together. They have to combine together to get good results so that we can achieve our targets. If we combine these two resources and capabilities, 
we create a competitive advantage. So what we do is the link between the resources, capabilities, and competitive advantage. First, we try and understand what are the resources we have. Then we see how can we convert these resources into capabilities. Accordingly, whether these capabilities can help the organization in assessing its strength and minimizing its vulnerability and then making a strong strategy so that we can have competitive advantage. Identify a firm's resources and capabilities. Right Now, there are three kinds of resources. Tangible resources, intangible resources, human resources. They are combined with the capability of the organization. What is the strategic capability that can really give us a competitive advantage? Four criteria. We talk about these four criteria. Once a capability complies to all these four criteria, it becomes a strategic capability. So we combine the resources with the capabilities we do a SWOT analysis. We see our strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats. After checking that, we make a strategy and we get a competitive advantage. Right. What are tangible resources? Now, this is this, this part of the whole video is very easy to understand because we already know what are tangible resources, easy to identify anything that we can see. Anything that we can see that, that can give us profit, the composition and characteristics. But it's not just about identifying these. It should be the motive to understand their potential for generating profit, right? So we should know what is the composition, what is the actual composition of these tangible resources? What are their characteristics? Suppose I'm talking about the capital of an organization, the share capital. We'll be talking about the share capital. What does it contain? Whether it is equity share capital, whether it is uh, uh, preference share capital, or whether it is debt, debentures, if debentures of what kind, what opportunities exist for the use, can the existing assets be used more profitably elsewhere? Right. So we have to understand what is the most important point in tangible resources. We have to understand its composition and its capability of giving us more profitable situations in future. The next one is intangible resources. Of course, we know perfect example of it is goodwill. These resources are more valuable than the tangible resources, the trademarks, the patents, the copyrights. They also create a source of a uh, sort of network resource, interform, interform uh, relationships. Remember, organization culture is also an intangible resource. That culture, that is our resource. The, the values, the ethics, that's our resource. So organization culture is also a resource. Why? Because it is the belief, the values, the assumptions. The next one, human resource, competency modeling. What is competency modeling? We set a standard. We identify a set of skills, content knowledge, attitudes, and values which are associated with superior performance within a particular job category. We set a benchmark. And then we assess each employee against that profile. So if you can recall something similar to benchmarking, which you studied earlier, right? So then there is a emotional and social intelligence. Now we'll talk about capabilities. Organization capability involves a coordinated behavior among organizational members. This distinguishes an organizational capability from an individual skill. When we create a process, a coordinated sequence of action occurs. And that's a capability. These small, small capabilities, they come together to form a high-level capability. 
when we co come to the concept of strategic capability, when we said that we need to have capability, right? What is a strategic capability? A strategic capability, as I said, it, it is something which has to pass all four tests, which are these four tests. Because once a capability becomes strategic, it will give me a competitive advantage. The first one is it should be valuable. It's important to recognize the value of resource. And this value lies in the value that it is creating for the customers. For example, I'm producing an anti-aging cream, right? For ages, say, above 50 years. The cost of production, the ingredients that I'm putting in that cream might not cost me a bomb. The manufacturing cost may be very less. Maybe I'm just using, say, for example, milk in that cream. Or I'm using a particular ingredient which can give that anti-aging kind of effect. But the value proposition that it is giving to my customer, to a lady who is aged 50 years, is much more, right? So my product is valuable. It might not be valuable to a lady who is just 20 years but much valuable for a lady aged 50 years, right? So my product should be able to provide that value. My capability should be able to provide that value. My capability should be rare. It is rare when there are no or say very few competitors who offer the same capability. And how can I achieve it? If I can achieve it, if I say um, uh, I have patents or I have some copyright. So it should be valuable. It should be rare. My product should be costly to imitate or replicate. When other organizations are my competitors, when they cannot obtain this particular capability that I have, why? Because due to cost advantage. Because maybe it's it costs cheaper to me, but for them it is costlier. So in that case, I become the leader. I become the boss. I have the monopoly. I'm having that strategic capability because my product is costly to imitate. The last one is my product should be non-substitutable. A resource and cap capability is non-substitutable when it is not possible for competitors to create value in the same way by using a different source of capability. It is non, it should be non-substitutable. I am using a particular product and I am giving some value to my customers. Right? I am producing some result. I am giving some value to my customers. Maybe my competitor is giving the same value, but he is using a different resource. He is using a different capability. Right? He cannot, he cannot provide the same capable, the same value by using a different uh, resource. So in that case, my product becomes non-substitutive. So to be a strategic capability, all four tests need to be passed. It should be valuable. It should be rare. It should be costly to imitate and it should be non-substitutive. When we do a functional analysis, functional an organization needs to take a survey of its capabilities through functional analysis. What are the capabilities that each of my firm function can provide to me? For example, my operation function can provide me the capability of operational flexibility, speed of response, reputation for quality, low cost. My um, marketing function can give me the capability of links with a particular global customer. Understanding customers' real needs, right? My finance and accounting function gives me a capability of uh, having an integrated financial information. My IT department is able to make use of customer information system. My human resource department is very effective. Why? Because it is giving us a capability of good selection process. Right. So what is functional analysis? What is the essence of functional analysis? 
what is the capability that each function of an organization can give? What is value chain analysis? It identifies a sequential chain of main activities that a firm undertakes. Now, if you can recall value chain analysis, we did when we did the module one also. So what is the value that my organization is generating at each level of the process? That is value chain analysis. The entire process is taking place. The value generated at each level of that process, that is value chain analysis. And when we combine this functional analysis, this value analysis, we know what are an organizational capability. We have to do a functional analysis. We have to see which function is giving me which capability. Value chain analysis, I have to see which step is generating, step of the process is generating how much value. We combine these two we get a clear picture of the organization's capability. Right? Is it good? Yes, all good. But there is a shortcoming. And this functional analysis and value chain analysis cannot identify the idiosyncratic capabilities. What are these idiosyncratic capabilities? Truly distinctive and critical to an organization's competitive advantage. They just give us an idea that these are the capabilities, but it does not, it cannot tell me that this is the crucial capability. This is the strategic capability. These two functions just give us a list. These are your capabilities. Now it's up to you. You identify your strategic capability. You identify your strategic capability, which is giving you a competitive advantage. So that's a shortcoming of the functional and value chain analysis. Now, after we are done with the analysis of uh, this, uh, uh, the people and organizational operational drivers, we do a SWOT analysis. We are done with the internal and external analysis. Right now, we have to combine the external analysis, internal analysis. Then we'll do a SWOT analysis. Once an organization's position and objectives are known, through SWOT analysis, we will proceed and we will see what is the gap analysis that can be performed to find what the organization needs to bring its current level to the desired level. Right. So SWOT analysis identifies the extent to which current operations of an organization and its specific strengths and weakness are relevant to and capable of dealing with changes that are taking place. I will analyze my strengths. I will analyze my weaknesses. I will see what are the opportunities that I have. I will see what are the how can I tackle with all these things? How can I tackle the threats? Right? If you talk about threats, what advantages the, uh, the, the organization has? What does the organization do well? Right? I'm talking from the internal perspective. What relevant resources I have, which my competitors do not have. Right? So what are the internal perspectives? It is strength and weakness. That's mine, right? That has come to me through my in, through the internal analysis of the organization. I came to know about my strengths. I came to know about my weaknesses. I came to know about my resources. I came to know about my capabilities. And if I talk about the external factors, the external analysis of the organization, that those are opportunities and threats. What are the opportunities lie for me, which I can manage with my strengths and weaknesses and the threats what are the what threats are there how i need to harness my opportunities how i need to capture those opportunities by using my strengths and weaknesses so the internal perspectives are strength and weaknesses external perspectives are opportunities and threats Then we'll talk about what is the purpose of this internal and external analysis. 
and the SWOT analysis. Now we'll undertake a gap analysis. What is gap analysis? Inconsistency between the two elements being compared. Gaps between the external environment and current strategy and gaps between the internal environment and current strategy. One thing that we have to keep in mind is that gap analysis is always applied at the business level. The strategy that an organization develops should be consistent with the current and expected future external environment and internal environment. Now, there is a very perfect example which is given in the book. Consider an organization that currently achieves a return on equity of 10%. It wishes to maintain the similar level for the next three years. So one is our current performance, one is our expected performance. Right. Now, what is happening externally? What is happening in my external environment? Is the market declining? The labor in shortage? The competitors are making more innovation? All these are external factors. They're preventing my organization from maintaining my profitability level if I can continue with my strategy. That is external inconsistency, right? If I want to achieve a particular level, but my external environments are stopping me, with, uh, they are not in compliance with my current strategy, it is not sufficient. That means there is a gap. So at the end of three years, I will not be able to achieve my expected performance if I do not change my strategy. So what happens is then these gaps, the gap between the expect the, the current performance and the future performance, that becomes a strategy driver. The my strategy, they start, we I need to make my strategy flexible. I need to understand that gap and accordingly I have to modify my strategy. That is called gap analysis. We see the external environment, current strategy. Is there a gap? We see the internal environment, current strategy. Is there a gap? Right? So we try and understand these gaps and then we try and plug those gaps. How can we plug those gaps? Understanding the drivers of performance and agreeing that there are gaps. If there is no agreement that the gaps exist, there is unlikely to be anything more than the limited support. I do not agree that there is a problem when I know that there is a problem. When I know in my head that there is no problem, why should I make efforts? So first of all, we have to understand, we have to, the reason um, that there is a gap between the external environment analysis and internal environment analysis. And accordingly, we do a SWOT analysis. We find out the gaps and then these gaps are plucked. When we talk about the internal environment um, gaps, the key stakeholders gap, the organizational performance is assessed to see how well it is meeting the expectation of key stakeholders, right? We have the ability to influence organization strategy. We have to understand whether we know the key stakeholders the expectations of these key stakeholders. Are they in tune with my current strategy, with my expected performance? If, not, if no, then there is a gap and I need to fix. The operational performance, the organization's performance needs to be assessed against its stated strategy to identify when the organization is not performing well and where it may have superior performance. Capability gaps. The same with the strategic drivers gap. The organization's position need to be assessed against competitors. The strategic drivers and its benchmark to identify gaps in strategic drivers. Right. So these are the internal inconsistencies. The same we can do for external environment. We need to understand the remote environment gaps. If you remember, we, when we did the remote environment analysis, we talked about the steeple factors, right? So we have to understand those remote gaps, those remote environment factors, the steeple factors. We have to check the influence of each of these factors on the current strategy and my expected level of performance. The, uh, then we talk about industry environment gaps. We talk up about the four or five force gaps. 
right we have to see those factors we have to see how they comply with the current strategy and what is the effect they may have on the future performance then the industry competitive uh, gap we studied about competitive advantage we rem remember if we studied about the differentiation and low cost strategy so an example of that could be a shift from print media to digital media it's a social change right it's a remote gap so what affect this particular scenario has on my current strategy we, and then also we have to identify if this trend continues, if this factor is continuously putting pressure on my strategy, that the print media is getting changed into digital media, will it affect my strategy in future? That's a gap that has been created between the external environment and my current strategy. If this trend continues, I will not be able to achieve my future performance, my future, my targeted goal. So there is a gap. I need to plug that. I need to change my strategy. I need to modify my strategy. So that is gap analysis for us. How much pressure the internal factors and the external factors are putting on the current strategy that is preventing it to meet its targeted goal, its future goal. That is gap analysis. So this was all about the people and organizational drivers. This is internal environment analysis, right? Then we studied about the SWOT analysis. Then we talked about the gap analysis. So what is the purpose of doing all this? Studies about the external environment, internal environment, the reason is to find the gaps, to plug those gaps by modifying our strategy, by being ready to adapt, by being ready to be flexible, by being agile. Right? So that's that completes our analysis, that completes our internal analysis. In our next video, we'll be talking more about and studying about the business models, the changing business environments and the business ecosystem. I hope you all have found some values in today's video. Please let me know your valuable suggestions and feedbacks and any of the particular topic that you may want to listen. Thank you so much. Keep learning, keep growing.